We are in our third week of a series that we've been calling Driftwood Hope. And it's really this series that, that we're covering because during this time, it feels a little bit shipwrecked. Like we all kind of feel a little bit jostled. And even this week, there's new shipwrecks that are happening. And so this is an opportunity that in the middle of all that, to remember the stories of the people who also uh, felt shipwrecked, where their life didn't quite turn out the way that they expected. Um, and, and, and I think that our only way of getting through this time with hope and getting through this time um, with courage is actually looking to the voices of those who have experienced shipwrecks in the past and to see what it looked like for them to cling to the driftwood and still have hope so that we too might be able to do the same thing, that we might have hope through the midst of whatever it is that happens next in this series and in this season. Um, So today we're actually going to be looking at a story that comes out of the book of Acts. And and I hope that you will join us. If you would like to read this story in its entirety, you really have to start in Acts 1. But if you want to get the um, abbreviated version of what we're really diving into today, you can check it out in Acts chapter 9. The context of this story is actually that Jesus has already died. He has rose from the dead and he has actually in the very beginning of Acts, he tells them, uh, we, we see evidence again that Jesus goes into heaven, that he rises up into heaven. And what happens next is that after Jesus goes back into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes upon the followers of Jesus and empowers them in incredible ways. Their lives are transformed and they're able to reach out to every member of their community in Jerusalem, regardless of their language, regardless of their background. And there is this overwhelming sense of generosity and caring and sharing and justice that comes over them that enables them to just kind of take whatever it is they have and offer it up to the whole group and say, you need something, I have something, let me give it to you. You need something, I have something, let me give it to you. You have something, I need something, please give it to me. So there's this amazing community that's being formed around this. And what happens is is they not only care for their community, the followers of Jesus, they actually look to the outside and they're wondering, how can we care for all of the people? And they begin caring for them regardless of their background, regardless of of their situation, the poor and marginalized, they reached out to all of them regardless of the language that they spoke and what they did was in caring for them, they also, also boldly proclaimed the reason why, the reason why they cared for them. And it was all because the kingdom of heaven has come to earth through the person and work of Jesus Christ, their Lord and their savior. And so they proclaimed this this thing, they proclaimed to this person and they said that Jesus has come. So all the places of injustice can now be made just and all of the people who were poor and tossed to the side can now be welcomed in. Everyone belongs in this kingdom. And Jesus came to release the oppressed and the broken and the bondaged. And he said, you're free now. And so they proclaimed this amazing thing that Jesus had done through dying on the cross and and raising from the dead. And every day, more and more people joined the followers of Jesus. They start out at the beginning of Acts as just like a hundred people that were there sort of praising Jesus, but when they were empowered by the Spirit and when they allowed that to transform them, when they began to care for those who were on the margins and those who were oppressed, it changed everything. And so this group that started out as 100 became 200 and 400 and then 1,000 and then 3,000 and then more and more and more and more. And it wasn't always organized well. Sometimes it was chaotic and confusing and messy, but it was amazing. The people just kept coming. And all that Jesus had, been, had spoken of was coming true. The kingdom of belonging and love was being experienced here on earth. And it was awesome. And it was exciting. But not for everybody. It was for the believers. But there was another group of people. There was another religious group that hated what was happening. It was the Jewish Pharisees. See, they had stood against Jesus from the very beginning and and they had thought that if they could figure out a way to kill him, that, that all of the people who followed him would just 
go away. (laughs) But that didn't happen. It was quite the opposite. They killed Jesus, but then he rose from the dead. And then all of the followers gathered together, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And things just kept escalating and growing and growing and growing. And now that it was exploding, they were furious. And the reason they were furious was was really because they were the group that for centuries had had all of the power. They had had all of the religious power. They were the ones that dictated what was right and what was wrong and who was in and who was out. And the more that this Jesus movement grew, the more it felt like their power was being diminished. For decades They had to find what was right and what was wrong and who was in and who was out. And all of that was just being threatened. And it was all a little too much to bear. Now, one of the members of this group, his name was Saul, and he was one of their best. He was the one who could kind of know all of the rules and all of the laws, and he was able to follow all of them precisely. He could look at a person and figure out from what they had done and their past and their lineage, whether they were supposed to be in or whether they were supposed to be out. And what made him more upset than anything else was that these Jesus followers just kept accepting everyone and he kept thinking, no, that's not the way that it's supposed to be. There are some people who are chosen by God and others who aren't chosen by God. And, and, and these Jesus followers, they're ruining everything. And so Paul, Saul made it his mission to hunt down the Jesus followers that were in Jerusalem. And he actually received permission from those in governing authority to hunt them down and burn down their houses and stone them and kill them. And so as a result, all these followers of Christ started scattering to different cities. They left Jerusalem out of, out of, uh, to get away from the hatred and the rage that was taking place there. But Paul, Saul felt like it wasn't enough to just scatter them. He didn't just want them to run away and start new communities in these other places. He thought, no, 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 we need to bring them back here. We need to imprison them. And so he went to the governing authorities and he said, can I do it? Can I go after them to other cities? Can I hunt them down and chase them and imprison them and bring them back? And they said, yes, you may. And so Saul got some buddies together and he hits the road. First stop, Damascus. And as he began with his buddies to walk to Damascus, something incredible happens. Something that left him feeling totally shipwrecked. Out of nowhere, suddenly from heaven, there is this blinding flash of light And this booming voice begins to speak as he falls to the ground. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in confusion, Saul responds, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And after the voice and the light, disappeared, the men who were traveling with Saul stood there speechless. You see, they had heard the voice also, but but they didn't see anything. They didn't know where it had come from. And what they heard now was this confused gasp from the mouth of their fearless leader as he padded the ground trying to find his bearings. It was the gasp of a desperate person whose world had been spinning because everything he thought he knew had been called into question. It was the gasp of a desperate person whose understanding of what was right and what was wrong had been completely turned upside down. See, the blinding light of, that Jesus brought shone this light on Saul's prejudice and his hatred and his fear, and it brought it to the light of day. And the truth of all of it was so blindingly bright that it left Saul unable to see. He was blind. 
And so the guys that were with him quickly surrounded him on all sides, picking him up from the shipwreck and leading him the rest of the way to Damascus. And for three days, Saul sat in darkness, unable to eat or drink, clinging to the driftwood of the wreckage that had just happened because of this encounter with Jesus. Now, in the Christian world, we talk a lot about Jesus being the one who rescues us from shipwrecks. But sometimes our encounter with Jesus and his kingdom can actually leave us feeling shipwrecked. Everything seems fine before Jesus walks in. (laughs) And now that Jesus has come, everything feels a little haywire. See, Jesus isn't the problem. It's just that his truth can be so bright and so blinding. It's like exiting a dark cave and then stepping into the full power of the sun. It can be jarring and disorienting and even painful. And we're really left after those moments to decide what to do in the middle of the wreckage. Will we allow what has just happened to reorient and change our entire lives? Or after three days, will we just shake it off and go back to the way that things were? And so Saul sits for three days, unable to see, unable to eat, unable to drink. And I just imagine that those are the exact questions that he was wrestling with himself and with God. He's asking the question, is he willing to learn an entirely new way to live and to speak? Is he willing to lay down all of his power and prestige that he had in this old walk of life and in this old group to become this newbie with, with no credit Could he possibly let go of all of that and walk into following Jesus into something different? And also the question, would they even accept him if he did? Now, too often our encounters with Jesus leave us completely unchanged because we deceive ourselves into believing that the encounter itself was good enough that the experience in and of itself was the point. We sort of treat sometimes our encounters with Jesus and the kingdom like a souvenir that we pick up when we're on a big trip. And we carry it with us and we say, yeah, this was a souvenir from the trip, but we don't actually let it change us at all. And I think what Jesus wants to ask in the middle of those experiences or after those experiences is really, he wants to say to us, no, the experience in and of itself isn't going to last very long. After a little bit, all of the emotions will fade. And Jesus wants to tell us that he was using the experience in order to bring us to a place where we finally see the places in our lives where we need to change, where we need to transform where we need to surrender. And so I think Jesus, after those moments, asks us these questions. He asks us, will you change? Will you surrender your whole life? Will you surrender your fears and your hatred and your friends and your status and your positions to allow me to transform you? And so likely, Saul was in the middle of this conversation with God for those three days, wrestling with all of the questions. And Saul sat and he waited for God to show up like he promised. Now, meanwhile, on the other side of town, there's a Christ follower. His name is Ananias. And while praying to the Lord, the Lord speaks to Ananias and he tells him, listen, there's a man down the road. You need to go to him. His name is Saul. You need to pray for him. And at hearing the name Saul, Ananias immediately starts to have a little bit of a panic attack. 
(laughs) You see, the reality is, is that Ananias had heard of Saul. Ananias knew who Saul was. And so he speaks back to the Lord and he says, but Lord, I have heard of what this man does. He has hurt and killed many, many people. He's arresting all of those who follow you. But the Lord speaks back to Ananias and says, no, 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 no. You're to go to him. He's gonna be praying. You need to pray for him. And most importantly, God tells Ananias, he has been chosen by me to proclaim and demonstrate my name to the whole world. So Ananias goes, and I just imagine that as he's walking down the street from his house to the house that Saul was at, that he's just having the same conversations play in his mind, this, these questions in his mind that are kind of like this, what am I doing? This guy is gonna kill me. He's hurt and he's killed lots of the people that I know. Why should I trust him now to be an ally in proclaiming the kingdom? And the other half of him is is having this other conversation. Now, come on, Ananias. If we really believe in the good news of Jesus, then even someone like Saul gets grace and transformation to be a part of this coming kingdom. See, sometimes the tricky thing about being a part of the kingdom of God is that the doors to the kingdom don't stay closed to those that have wronged us or hurt us. Instead, God is working through the pages of history in order to begin to bring reconciliation and restoration. And the question becomes, when God opens the doors to redemption and reconciliation for those that have brought harm to us, will we bar the doors shut or will we join hands? But before Ananias knew it, He found himself at the steps of the house where Saul was at. And he walked in maybe with a knot in his stomach. And there was Saul, stricken blind, deep in prayer, barely noticing that Ananias had even entered the room. And Ananias took a deep breath. He stretched out his hands, placed them on Saul. And he began to pray, Brother Saul, The Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off of Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. And Saul stood up, he was baptized and he ate. He gathered up all of his belongings and he moved in with Ananias and all of the other followers. Within days, he used all of the power and position that he had had as a Pharisee and a Jew. And he marched himself straight into the synagogue and he began to proclaim that Jesus was the son of God, that Jesus was the Lord and the savior and that the kingdom had come. And all who heard Saul were amazed. And they wondered to themselves, wait a second, isn't this the guy? Isn't this the guy who just like a week ago was like murdering and killing Christians and now here he is proclaiming that Jesus is the son of God? What the heck has happened? It was this encounter with Jesus and his kingdom that felt a little bit like a shipwreck. That was actually a moment that changed everything for Saul and everything about his life. It changed who he hung out with. It changed who he listened to. It changed his name from Saul to Paul. It changed what he proclaimed and what he demonstrated. Saul goes from being this guy who hunts down and kills followers of Christ to being Paul who plants churches throughout the entire Mediterranean world. He brings heaven to earth in the spaces that he inhabits and he even writes most of the New Testament. Now, sometimes there are moments in our lives that feel a bit the same. 
It feels a bit like everything we thought we knew, everything we thought was true, proves to be more skewed than we ever could have imagined. And that may be that we were never seeing quite as clearly as we thought we were. And then we have this encounter with God. We have this encounter with Jesus and his kingdom. And everything changes. See, in that moment, we have a choice to allow that encounter with God and the truth of that encounter to shift everything in our lives. The way we see the people that we hang out with, the things that we listen to, the things we learn from, the actions that we choose to take from this point on. Or we have a choice to brush it off and return to the way things were. Now, I have a gut feeling that this season has left you with numerous encounters with Jesus and his kingdom. And they might have left you feeling a little bit shipwrecked. Maybe some of them were as stark as this moment on the Damascus road that Saul experiences. Or maybe they were a little less. Maybe they were much more subtle. But either way, that encounter was designed to be a moment that leads us to surrender, to be remade, to be transformed. That just like when Jesus sat in the dark tomb for three days, he doesn't come out the same person. He comes out radically transformed. He comes out as the king, the victorious king over sin and death and brokenness. And he's offering to you the same opportunity to be radically transformed. And my prayer today is that the encounters that you've had with Jesus over the past 12 weeks, or even this week, might not just be tossed aside as a souvenir, but instead that they would move you to this place of surrender so that you might be remade and transformed. Let's pray. Father God, you are a God of holy encounters. That as we read your scripture, there are all of these moments, these defining points where you show up in uncertain and radical ways that feel just jarring because of the weight of them. We want to be a people that when we encounter you, we are transformed. And so in this moment, Father, I ask that you would supernaturally rise to the surface all of the encounters that our people have had, that they would be stirred in their soul as they remember, oh yeah, I did, I had that encounter or I'm having this encounter. And so Father God, would, would you stir that inside of them and would they not be able to brush it off? But would it be something that leads to transformation? so that we would be people that moved forward from those moments, following you anywhere, regardless of what it costs us, regardless of what we have to let go of, regardless of where we have to move into in places of uncertainty. Father God, we ask that you would be the God of transformation in our lives. We pray all of these things in your holy and your precious name. Amen. All right, guys, we are going to um, do a little bit of Q&A. Um, uh, there's one question that's come in. How do we go about repairing the relationships we have damaged because of our past mistakes? This is a great question. And honestly, there's not one easy answer to do this well. I think that I rely and go back on the fact that we as followers of Christ are empowered by the Holy Spirit and that first and foremost, we need to go to the Spirit in prayer and we need to ask the Spirit to lead us into those relationships just as Ananias was led into this relationship with Saul. But I also think that we don't just wait for a specific prompting because we know as people of God and followers of Christ, we are called to reconciliation. And so I think that the first thing you start with is probably an apology. 
It's probably coming to the place where you can admit the places that you have damaged the relationship and that it doesn't come with a but or it doesn't come with any of those things, but just this is what I'm sorry for and this is what I've done. And I think once we can get to that place, we can then begin to make decisions about what's the best next step Sometimes if that person has equally damaged us, sometimes the, like they were an abuser in our life, sometimes the best step is to offer forgiveness or an apology and then let them go. Or if it's somebody that we have caused tremendous abuse to, it's an apology, but, but we're not expecting that we're gonna be best friends moving forward. Now, sometimes God does something radical where that is allowed to happen and that both hearts are in a place to bring reconciliation. And in that case, it, it can be as simple as an open invitation, an open conversation to just talk about what has happened and what has been experienced. And I would say the biggest thing is to not get offended. <laughs> That if you have harmed somebody and they want to tell you all of the ways that they have harmed, that you have harmed them and that your actions have caused them pain, you, you sometimes have to listen to that, as, as painful as that might be. Um, we have another question that says, um, what do you tell people that feel inadequate to fight that fight, even though we know God is in control? Is this insecurity? I know God is in control. And they have a, a, another little piece that says, fighting racism and hate. So what do you tell people that feel inadequate to fight that fight, even though they know that God is in control? Um, yes. My answer is yes. <laughs> I will be totally honest with you, it, particularly since this person said fighting racism and hate. Um, I feel really inadequate to speak in to the issues that are happening in terms of racism. I feel really scared. Uh, I know that God is in control. I, I know that injustice is wrong, but I feel really inadequate. And I think that what we do as people of God is we put on our brave pants. <laughs> we be people that allow the Holy Spirit to empower us. I don't know that Ananias felt unscared or adequate to go to Saul and to pray for him. I don't know that Paul, Saul, who becomes Paul, felt adequate the first time that he steps into the synagogue and begins to proclaim the very person that he, began, that he was once persecuting. I don't know that adequacy is the right thing. I, I think we do the best we can to learn and we do the best we can to cover ourselves in prayer, and we allow the Holy Spirit to prompt us with the next step as we go. And the reality is, is particularly in this particular issue that you're talking about, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. And we have to be willing to make them and to apologize when we do. Because I think that that's the only way that we can, that's how you work out relationships and that's the only way that we can get better. Guys, I wanna thank you for those questions um, that you gave. Uh, those, are, those are hard questions and I love that we are a congregation that can ask these hard questions and that we can engage those things together and that we're truly trying to figure out how to follow Jesus into the places we're uncertain of and, and how to follow Jesus when he's begun to transform our lives and, and created encounters for us. So I wanna thank you for those questions.